learning world. So um, my, my main point here, you know, I want to just kind of summarize it before, before we dig into it. My main point is that integrated performance really depends on the kinds of equations that you're solving. And so the first thing to try to understand when trying to understand how to optimize integrators for scientific machine learning is specifically to ask the question, what kinds of equations do show up in scientific machine learning contexts, right? Um, so first of all, what is uh, scientific machine learning? Well, scientific machine learning is this discipline that, which is kind of characterized here where you, know, you can think, kind of think about it as, you know, it's the integration of prior scientific knowledge into the machine learning space. So if you know, you know your standard deep learning, people do a lot of things where you have these large data sets and from these large data sets, you can make predictions as to, you know, you know uh, whether the a you have a cat or a dog in a picture, right? If you have three billion pictures, well, what we want to do is we want to make use of scientific information, which is not necessarily three billion pictures, right? For example, um, we have information about how general relativity works. We don't have a single experiment that gives us a three billion line data set, but we know that the equations are correct. And so, how can we use that information at, to be able to improve our machine learning in contexts where we know scientific laws must hold, right? That is the core thesis behind scientific machine learning. And so a lot of these methods that people have been making use of um, have a very similar structure. So this is, uh, this is a method that we developed called the universal approximator differential equation, also shortened to universal differential equation, where one of the things that you can do is define and solve a differential equation where, um, where for example, you have missing parts of the function. So, you know, if you, if you think about a neural network as a universal approximator, neural networks are things that can represent arbitrary Rn to Rm functions. Um, so you can think about it as, for example, a function, a, a arbitrary function, continuous, sufficiently nice, um, that takes in n things and spits out m things, right? So basically you don't need to necessarily think about machine learning models or neural networks in this context as things that are data driven or are learned from big data there's nothing to do with any of that right we're using it as a function approximator what we want to do with these function approximators is use them to approximate the functions that we did not necessarily know how to approximate in our original model. So here, for example, this is a lock of Volterra equation where we say, well, we know that if you leave rabbits in a room, they, you get exponentially more rabbits. If you leave wolves in a room, you get exponentially less wolves over time as they starve. And you put rabbits and wolves together in a room. Um, my mother never told me what happens in, in that room. So we need to discover that directly from the data, right? So, so this is where uh, the universal approximator differential equations come in, where there are some parts of our model that we don't necessarily know how to model. And so it's the functional form that we're trying to recover as part of the, the process with our prior embedded knowledge about things that we do know to be true about a model. Um, and this is then the, the, this general form where we're able to say, you know, take a take a differential equation where we have known parts and unknown parts. We use the neural networks or other universal approximators to capture the unknown parts. We train the, these approximators against data using a loss function defined over the simulator, and then we perform an analysis. Right, the moment that you have this. Uh, this unknown captured as part of by some function like a neural network, then you can start to do things like ask questions about, you know, what are the, what's the sensitivity of this neural network with, with respect to given variables? Um, what's the best polynomial approximation to this thing that we've learned? What's the best, you know, general approximation, et cetera? All, all these kinds of questions can be answered by looking at that computational representation of the function that was missing, that it was trained through the neural network training process, right? And so this is the kind of general flow of the universal differential equation. Um, to kind of look at it in a bit more detail, let's look at it in step by step, right? So here we're looking at 21 days of a pandemic model. Um, in the first 21 days, we fit data with U prime equals a neural network. This is standard machine learning. We told it nothing about how epidemics work. It extrapolates in a way that doesn't do so well, right? What we then do is we say, okay, now let's put some prior information around it, you know, SIR model type things. Um, you know, with this prior information, we now have a model that is epidemic-like, but it has a bunch of uh, 
ha has a part that we don't know how to model. This is exposure. Um, we fit that with a neural network and we can see that this can do a lot better. And then finally, instead of just having the neural network, we can use the sparse regression to be able to recover what these missing terms could have been in a fairly general way that kind okay, of overcomes uh, cursor dimensionality. All right. So this is a very quick uh, introduction to universal differential equations. If you haven't seen them before, I'd say check out some of the other talks that I've given on them. But uh, the, the, the core that I wanted to show here is what these differential equations tend to look like so that way we can start to dive into the, the efficiency aspects, right? So kind of just skipping ahead, you know, so, so here this is like a simple example in COVID-19, but there's been many different uh, cases. So here, for example, um, is a case where with binary black holes, you can presuppose Newtonian mechanics and say, well, black hole systems need to have relativistic corrections. Please learn the relativistic corrections from a small amount of data and extrapolate forward. The black dots are the, the points of the training data. And then you see that it extrapolates forward almost perfectly on, onto the, onto the uh, data from the gravitational waves. Right. So, so, you know, this is an example of, of universal differential equations being used in a real context. Um, another real context is with earthquake safe buildings. I'd say if you really want to look, dive into universal differential equations as a thing and to see, you know, all of the validations behind them and more about these kinds of methods, please check out the talk. The talk. There's multiple of them on YouTube. One of them is accurate and efficient physics informed uh, learning through differentiable simulation. That talk will go into a lot of these examples to kind of show and hopefully convince you that, you know, the universal differential equations are well validated as a tool for improving machine learning with prior knowledge that we have scientifically, right? Um, so, you know, moving on then to, you know, away from the, the question about, you know, so, so that first part is just, this is what we're doing. Universal differential equations are very useful because prior scientific knowledge improves the ability to do machine learning and extrapolate from very small amounts of data. We see this in many scientific contexts from chemical reactions and, and, and black hole physics and all this, that we can use this as, as an effective tool, right? Um, so question then is, okay, talking to the mathematicians of the room, how do we effectively train UDEs and how do we use that to start to talk about numerical methods that are better for training UDEs? Um, so UDE costs, I would say, are weird in the context of ODE solving, right? Um, there are three points to, to, to make note of. One is that they generally have small systems, right? So we're really looking at things of like, you know, 200 ODEs or less, right? We're talking about chemical reaction networks that we want to understand mechanistically. We're walking, we're, we're talking about, you know, epidemic models. We're talking about, you know, uh, the physical models of, of small systems, right? You know, it's these, the systems don't necessarily have to be large to be interesting um, in this regime, and especially for a lot of cases like biological modeling, you know, trying to understand a, a biological system really is understanding their interaction between 30 or 40 different proteins, and so we don't necessarily expect huge equations. Um, now, one of the key pieces here, though, is that we're doing an inverse problem, right? So we're doing an inverse problem to find the weights of the neural network, which effectively are parameters of the differential equation. So it is a parameter inference problem for a large number of parameters. And importantly, the cost of this, of this ODE is quadratic with respect to the hidden layer size, right? So this is something that is, that is kind of the key detail in here, right? So you might only have two ODEs in the Locke Voltaire example. But if your hidden layer size needs to be 100, well, then your your cost is like you know 100 cube, you know 100 cubed with even for this two ODE system, right? So why does the hidden layer so, uh, cost get large? Well, in order for the universal uh, approximation property to come into play for neural networks, they have to be sufficiently large, right? It's, it's a property that is asymptotic. As the number of hidden layers goes to infinity, as the size of the hidden layers goes to infinity, then neural networks can approximate R to RM to, R to RM function, right? So there is a caveat in there that did not describe in the beginning, and it's that you need sufficiently large neural networks. 
How large is sufficiently large? Well, that kind of depends, right? We find that in some of these examples, you can use layer sizes of eight. You can, some of them, you need layer sizes of 100. Maybe even the optimization gets smoother at 1,000, right? In fact, as you make these layer sizes larger and larger and larger, the optimization actually becomes easier because your loss landscape smooths out. There's some properties of neural networks that cause that. Um, so the interesting thing in for this kind of problem then is that you might only have four ODEs, but you might have hidden layer sizes of 256. And so therefore you have a very expensive ODE solve with four ODEs and very expensive F functions, right? And so the question is, what integration techniques are good for this scenario, right? Um, so normally when we've been thinking about integration routines, you think about, you know, you almost have like a linear cost with the number of, 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 of terms, right? So if you think about like a PDE discretization, right? You have U of I plus one minus two U of I minus da, 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 right? But that's, that cost is linear with the number of ODEs. And so therefore you really think, oh, I, I have something where my F is not so expensive per ODE, but there are a lot of ODEs. So therefore I need to think about tools which allow for reusing factorizations of Jacobians and that da, 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 da. And this leads you to things like BDF methods, right? You know, some of the standard ones are ODE15S or, or CVODE, right? Um, and that, that's kind of what has led to a lot of people using these kinds of integrators in a lot of contexts. BDF methods are probably the best integrator for PDEs. But for this scenario, we have a very different looking problem, right? We have small Jacobians where the Fs can be extremely costly to evaluate. And so for these kinds of problems, what should we be doing instead, right? That's really the underlying question that needs to be addressed with this kind of problem. And so, so, you know, this is just reinforcing that, okay, so how do we actually train these things? We, we, we put their, so, you know, we take one of these equations that has a neural network in there, we put its solution into a loss function, and so therefore we need to take gradients of this. So it's not just solving an equation that has this form, but it's also, it's, it's really the key problem is taking gradients or taking, solving adjoints of problems that have this form, right? Um, now, you know, we, we, we can talk about adjoints. I, I'm not going to have the time to go into detail here, but in the derivation of the adjoint uh, differential equation, something comes up where, you know, so, so for example, the, ad, the, diff, the derivative of a cost function with respect to ordinary differential equation taken in the adjoint sense gives you an ODE that you have to solve in reverse uh, for calculating that derivative, right? Now, um, what this really comes down to then is a three-step process. So calculating these derivatives is you solve the original ODE going forwards, you solve an adjoint ODE going in reverse, and then you have to solve this integral equation, right? Um, now, we call this the adjoint method, but in reality, there's not really just a adjoint method because there's many different ways to do these, these steps, right? So for example, you know, when you have to solve this, this equation going in reverse, well, there, you have to calculate the Jacobian with respect to the forward value as you do this. So how do you do that? Well, three things you can do. You, you, can, you can append that equation that you solve going forwards. You can append that same one and reverse it as you go backwards. You can store the entirety of U of T going forwards as a dense output, or you can do a type of checkpointing, which, you know, for example, Sundials um, first made use of, right? So, you know, even when we talk about the simplest adjoint method, there's many different ways to implement it. And now we, we recently had a paper on it's called Stiff Neural Ordinary Differential Equations, which showed that there's actually a trade-off between how you can do this, right? So um, the, the way of doing it via the reverse uh, ends up being numerically unstable, and so you shouldn't use that unless you have a very non-stiff equation. Storing the entire U of T going forwards uh, is high in memory, but is less compute than doing a checkpointing method. Now there's, and, and that just means that there's an engineering trade-off, right? So why might you, uh, what are some cases where you might want to store the entire U of T going forwards? Well, in a universal differential equation case, you might only have, you know, 20 ODEs. And so, you know, the, the ODEs solved going forwards and using the neural network might have been very expensive, but holding on to that full continuous interpolation might not actually be that memory intensive, and so you might as well just do it, right? And so, you know, it's, it's not something you would ever do in a PDE context, but it's something that you want to have in, as an option for these a UDE contexts where there might not be as big of a memory cost for the forward solve. 
right? Similarly, there, uh, there are many different ways to compute the integral term that's required in, inside of the adjoint calculation. Um, one, uh, some, 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 some of the recent software have been doing things like appending, you know, uh, the mu differential equation uh, that calculates the, this, this integral. Though if you're doing that, that it turns out that, that that term for adding that differential equation, you know, if you add that differential equation to your first pass, this differential equation is not sized like you. It's not sized like the original equation, but this integral is instead sized like the number of parameters. And so if you do that naively, then you have a reverse pass, which is the size of states plus size of parameters. And if the, you then use a stiff ODE solver, you're going to cube that parameter cost. And if your parameter cost is extremely large in comparison to your, your state's cost, this is going to basically balloon the size of your, of your uh, cost for the adjoint. And your adjoint is actually no longer more efficient than just doing the most naive things at, in, uh, at that point, right? So, so I think that, you know, there's been a lot of literature from, from the neural ODE liter uh, literature, you know, the neural ordinary differential equation literature that says, oh, just, you know, d do this thing where you reverse a solve. And it's like, no, 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 that's going to th make things memory unstable, you know, but you also don't need to go all the way to checkpointing. There's, you know, something, a third secret option in the middle, which can be useful for some of these contexts and being able to switch between checkpointing and, and not can be helpful for this context. But then also, you know, doing the thing where you append the, the, uh, the value to integrate backwards, like has been suggested in some SciML literature, um, it turns out that that's not a good idea at all. And avoiding that by directly doing the integral in other, other ways, such as how differential equations and sundials do, is actually pertinent to make sure you don't get a cubic parameter cost inside of your evaluation um, and so I think that that, that one some one some mid summary of that is that there are many ways to calculate the adjoint you know the, the way that you write down the equation is not computable translating that to something that's computable uh, give, is, is can be done in many different ways and a lot of those are somewhat wrong in, in for this context of where you might have stiff dynamics and you might not necessarily have memory bounds and etc cetera, etc cetera, right but in when you're in you know notice that all of these are really different engineering trade-offs if you have memory uh, if you have have memory concerns or compute concerns or stability concerns, then you choose different methods in here, just like you choose different ODE solvers. So um, there's one other thing to mention, which is that inside of the, the, the reverse pass, you can do this without ever constructing the, the, the Jacobian by using by integrating reverse mode automatic differentiation and its vector Jacobian products directly into that solve, because this is a, this right here is actually the, the the standard form of what's what's done in, in a reverse mode pullback. And so this ends up being a lot faster than doing finite differences or other means for calculating that Jacobian. And so tools that integrate the reverse mode automatic differentiation uh, can really outperform tools that, that by default will be using the finite difference approximation to this uh, to this Jacobian. This is this is probably one of the main reasons why for for uh, th for things like universal differential equations, people will see a large performance improvement um, using the adjoint methods. One of the big contributors is if you did not know about this fact, um, differential equations not JL and the Julia tools will automatically do a trick here that will that basically decrease the cost by an order of magnitude or two, which you'd have to do manually in some other tools like uh, CVODES. Um, that option does exist in things like CVODES, but it won't do the reverse mode trick automatically. Um, yeah, so I've so uh, I want to go on to the next point of you know talking about some integrators. So that's how you do, do the adjoint. But you know, uh, if you just need to solve two hundred ODEs lots of times, you know the, these kind of small ODEs lots of times, what should you do? We've been looking into two different things: parallelism of the solver and parallelism between solves. So let's talk about parallelism of the solver. Um, so, so solving ODEs is very serial, and people have looked at methods that are good for asymptotically large equations. If your equation, if you have thousands and thousands of ODEs, uh, there's kind of no reason to parallelize the ODE solver because almost all the time is spent doing LU factorization, and that LU factorization will parallelize itself, right? Uh, because you know any 
any respecting LU factorization is going to be a par parallelized one, like a oomph back or a blast based, right? Um, so the real question is, if you only have like 200 ODEs, well, what can you do? If you actually look at the, the heuristics for a lot of these things like blast and such, they won't even multi-thread at this level. So you have a completely serial solve, even with this, with a stiff solver at this point. And so what can you do at this point? And this is where we came up with some new techniques. Um, you know, so, so there is some research on uh, things like parallel and time techniques. Those generally need very good hardware. Uh, for example, the x braid group uh, is one of the national lab groups working on this for, for exascale uh, cases. They showed that you need 256 cores to outperform a serial. That's not very good. Um, you know, within step parallelism, it, parallelization did exist a little bit. There was some literature out there. But what we wanted to do is we want to create the first like core solver that really makes use of good uh, 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 implicit parallelism inside of the solver. Um, and one of the reasons why I went to extrapolation methods is because they're arbitrary order, and there's a nice way to be able to 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 handle this, right? Because when you if you look at these extrapolation methods, they're basically solving Euler's method or implicit Euler's method with delta t, you know, delta t over two, delta t over three, delta t over four, and then they're summing up those different solutions. But if you do this, then you know your your uh, your Euler method, your implicit Euler with delta t, and your implicit Euler with delta t over two, you know, are factorizing different matrices. They're factorizing i minus delta uh, delta j, i minus delta two over j, or delta t over two j, uh, i minus delta t over three j. They're all different factorizations. And what you can do then is you can do these factorizations in parallel um, and then just, you know, do all these solves in parallel in a, in a nice uh, way. And then there's a nice way to be able to make that into a, um, a static, uh, parallelized uh, form. What we've been able to show then is that in the cases between 3 to 200 ODEs, this ends up being the fastest solver by about 2 times to 4 times, um, outperforming things that you'd, that you'd rec uh, understand in here, like CVODE's BDF method, um, some of the Rosenbrock methods, etc., etc., right? And so this is, you know, tuned to, you know, it doesn't, this does not do well as you could say if it asymptotically large ODEs because, again, in that scenario, what happens is that you end up getting parallelism inside of the LU factorization, and so this parallelism doesn't matter as much. Also, uh, exp uh, extrapolation methods are not as efficient as a lot of other methods, and so this is really only gaining its efficiency through the parallelism. And so therefore, you need to be in this regime, 300 to 200 ODEs, in order to get that uh, speed up, which a lot of UDEs tend to actually be in, and so therefore, it's a good thing to do. Um, one caveat is you cannot have implicit parallelism in F, and so this actually has a, a size limit on the on the on the size of the OD of the uh, neural networks that can be in there. Because if their BLAS operations are multi-threading, then you'll have you know things. So so in the cases where you have like you know uh, size sixteen hidden layers, this ends up being the thing that ends up being more, most efficient for stiff uh, UDEs. Um, you know, and, and what I'm showing here is really that, you know, there, there's nothing different. There, uh, you just change which algorithm you use in the ODE solver and poop, then it comes, it becomes multi-threaded using this special method, right? The other thing that you can do is parallelism between solves. So if you have to do many batches against data, then you might have to solve many different o uh, of the same ODE with different parameters at the same time. Um, now the traditional way you would have done this is you would have taken a, a, a normal solver, so a solver for arrays on GPUs, and, uh, arrays, and you make that into a solver that works on GPU-based arrays. You know, things like ODE and, uh, and Boost did this, things like CVODE uh, will do this, and they'll do that with Raja and stuff. This is the standard way of GPU parallelism for PDE systems, right? You just make your your LU factorization, all this stuff, work on the GPU instead of on a CPU array, right? And so developing a batched ODE solver, one that solves many different ODEs with different, uh, the same ODE with many different parameters and different initial conditions, uh, you can develop that by using a, a GPU array-based solver, um, you know, you can use an array-based GPU solver uh, just by making a, a block triangular system of the different ODEs that you're solving, right? You just place them one after the other and make that just a giant GPU array and you send it in there, right? 
But the issue, there's some issues with that approach. One is that if you do that, all of them are taking the same steps, and so that might be slower on a stiff system. Also, it, every single time that you're doing an operation, you're doing an array-based operation, which ends up having a lot of G different GPU communication. So instead of doing this through an array-based so solver, what we thought of was, well, what if we actually take an entire ODE solver and make that be a specific G a a GPU kernel itself, which you then just call with different initial conditions. And what we saw from that was we were able to actually outperform the array-based uh, methods by about 20 to 100 times on ODEs that are less than size 200, right? Again, this has nothing to do with performance of, of GPU-based ODE solves, uh, stiff ODE solves for large-scale PDEs. This is specifically for if you have, you know, 50 ODEs and you need to solve the same 50 ODEs with 10,000 different parameters, right? This approach of doing the GPU parallelism is better for than trying to use the PDE-based solver and just assuming you have block triangular, you know, uh, or, or block diagonal uh, sparsity pattern and you have different solves happening in different parts of the array, right? Instead, directly using a kernel can just be more efficient and so and by quite a bit. And we show that we can do this on CUDA, Intel One API, AMD GPU, and, and Apple GPUs. It also works on, on IPUs as well. So about, it ends up being about 20 to 100 times faster than Jackson PyTorch based GPU solvers, and we're pretty sure it's about the same with, uh, with Sundials. I mean, because and, and even our own implementation, we, we built one with, a, with the array-based form as well. It also, that also falls in almost the exact same spot, right? You know, it's bound by the GPU communication speed and the GPU kernel uh, to spin up costs. So basically what this shows is that for small ODEs, actually building specific kernels for that ODE ends up being more efficient rather than trying to use a gen general kernels like you know matrix multiply LU factorization and stuff. Like a GPU specific kernel that is then reused throughout all the cores is just much more efficient for small ODEs, not for large ODEs. So I'm not gonna be able to go into pins. Basically, if you do all this correctly, pins are about 10,000 times fast, uh, 10,000 times slower. So don't use pins if you have very optimized other tools. And there's a whole story behind that. But yeah, so, so you know, hopefully this gives a quick introduction to uh, why we do what we do in the CIML organization. We've been focusing a lot on code optimization and specific ODE solvers that are related to the types of problems that we see in UDEs, which can be quite different from the problems that are seen for large scale PDEs. Um, we do have some PDE things as well, and that's a whole different talk, but this shows that you really want to specialize the solvers towards the domain that you're working on. So, yep, thank you very much.